the first day, I remember when I grabbed a couple of things um, that I wanted to buy, brought them to the cashier, and the cashier was like, uh, your total adds up to this much. Hey, total? What is total? Like, <laughs> I didn't understand because I was <laughs> In India, they, they said total, the pronunciation and accent, everything was different. What, is, what does he mean by total? What is total in this? <laughs> it's just a juice and, and some. there's no total in here. <laughs> So in this episode, we'll delve into the theme of resilience and the pursuit of new beginnings, which lies at the heart of our podcast. The story of our guest today is a testament to the human spirit's ability to overcome obstacles and embrace change. Born in Afghanistan and later venturing into India, then Canada and now US, she embodies the essence of cultural diversity and the experiences that come with living across different geographies. Let's learn more from her as she shares her insights, experiences and wisdom gained from a life shaped by diverse cultures and the pursuit of new beginnings. Please welcome Asifa. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Good answer. Uh, I'm excited to be here. It's going to be a fun time together with my stories. Absolutely. Very excited to talk to you. Thank you for coming to the podcast. So, Asifa, let me start by asking you, which I ask most of my guests, is what's this one habit you adopted that has changed your life? The one habit that I have um, adopted is um, keep adjusting to new life. Mm. I love change. I always make changes in my life and uh, adjusting to those changes, adjusting to new life. Hmm. That's the habit that I'm proud of. Definitely. I think that's the theme of my podcast as well, to embrace change and embrace living in this new world for sure. Okay, so let me take you back to the time you spent in Afghanistan, uh, particularly in Kabul, I believe, where you were born. Yes. Tell us a little bit about your formative years and how was it like just growing up there? Okay, just uh, give you a little bit um, brief background about Afghanistan. It's a, it's a war zone most of yeah. the time. There was war going on all the time. So um, my childhood was in war, but it was not so bad because we lived in Kabul. It was the capital. Uh, it was a cold, cold uh, war at the time between Russia and the U.S. And um, our country was affected as well. But we were not so much worried because kept the capital, Kabul, was safer. Mm-hmm. And I had a happy uh, childhood. Um, I was born in a middle-class family. Um, There was a lot of form, love, and um, entertainment every weekend, Mm -hmm. which included Hindi, watching Hindi movies every week religiously. Okay. That's why it's like in my uh, memory all the time. And we learned Hindi language. It was a fun time we had. And then um, civil war broke uh, broke out in Afghanistan, and we had to leave Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We moved to India. And in India, we were like, now we are expert in Hindi language and now we will not have any problem and we were excited to be in a country yeah. that we always dreamt to um, to see because mm-hmm. we were watching movies and we always wish to see the movie stars place India and mm-hmm. Mumbai so now we are finally in India we were really excited um, to be in India and yeah that was like a brief uh, information about my journey from Afghanistan to India and what, what what city did you guys go to in uh, India? New Delhi. New Delhi. Okay. And what what was like, would you say the, the most um, amusing or like an interesting cultural difference you encountered while when you first arrived in India? Um, Indian culture is a little bit similar to mm-hmm. our culture, but in India, it was a different environment. People are very social, warm. Um, it was like, easy to adjust to that culture for me. It was not a big cultural shock, uh, may call it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was already familiar uh, with the culture a little bit from the movies, mm. but they were not familiar with my culture. So I had to yeah. kind of teach my friends, this is where I'm ca- coming from, and this is our culture, this is me, and this is my family. And it was, it was a pleasant experience. I loved the weather, the food. 
the social life. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't hear the word depression in India at all. In my eight <laughs> years I lived there, I never heard this word depression because it didn't exist. Yeah, I didn't see it, so it didn't exist. Maybe there is some, but I didn't see it. But when I came to Canada uh, for the first time, I heard the word depression that I was not familiar mm. with. So uh, that experience in India is a pleasant experience. There could also be possibility the reason you didn't hear the word depression because maybe like a decade ago or maybe more than that, the, the word depression was itself a taboo. Like you cannot say the word depression. If somebody says that, maybe the person is sick. That was how it was kind of signified. Um, okay. So, but but I think at the same time, I understand the the point you're coming from. That yes, in general, in India, people try to you know live together. The families live together. Yeah. They celebrate together. They have some of the other thing like every weekend planned. I think sometimes I remember my aunts and uncles would come randomly in the evening, you know, knock our doors and come and sit with us and have dinner sometimes. And nothing is scheduled there. That could it, be it the case. It doesn't happen anywhere. Yeah, it, it happens yeah. in India. And yes, Afghanistan also because um, at the time there was no phone or, or anything. So, so people yeah. would just randomly show up and knock at your door like, hey, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you, yeah. they call it unexpected guest here, but it was like a surprise for us and we would always be happy to see someone randomly. And that was the same thing in India. So that's what my friends would do. They would just come. Um, we didn't have cell phone at the time. We had one phone at home. But there was no cell phone, mm -hmm. so they would just show up and then they would be like, okay, and like, do you want to study together? Do you want to go for a movie? But to my surprise, mm -hmm. in Afghanistan, we were watching Hindi movies, but when I came to India, Indians were interested more in American movies. So in India, mm -hmm. every weekend, we were going to watch American movies, not Indian movies. I was like, mm -hmm. uh, like it was a little bit funny because... Um, we were watching Hindi movies like uh, regularly on a daily basis, but then uh, like on the weekends, um, we would go watch American movies because Indians like uh, American movies a lot. And yeah, it was, it was a very great experience that I had. I think it all depends which part of India uh, you live in or you go to. I think I think for example, if you come come from the northwestern part where I come from, Punjab, we might watch more Hindi and Punjabi movies. But then I think the place you were living in was one of like the metropolitan cities, right? And they were very much uh, influenced by the not influenced but exposed to the Western culture a little more than the other cities, I would say. So that could be the reasons you are uh, watching the American movies. Yeah, it could be because people were speaking like half English, half Hindi as well. They were, it was not a hundred yeah. percent Hindi. So yeah, you're right. And if you could like go back, Asifa, and live like one memory from your childhood, maybe in Afghanistan or India, which one it would be and why? The only one uh, memory um, that I am always that I will always remember was this um, family connection. A family connection we had um, in Afghanistan and the same thing mm -hmm. uh, in India. So like here, um, you have to get to know the person for a long time and before you will get connected and, and build friendship yeah. and any kind of relationship. But over there, it's not like that. You just meet the person, you open up. The person mm. opens up to you and you open up to them and then uh, your friends your your like family that's the only mm -hmm. memory that i always keep from my childhood and it and it happened to me most of my childhood in, in afghanistan in india i didn't see a big difference um i always it was easy to make friends uh, in both places Okay. Okay. Yeah. I think I can also kind of think of the same thing. Like I come from a family where we were 15 people living in the same house. I would love to go back and experience that again. Just that, that having so many people around and so many like positivity around you. I think I, I think I would say I kind of miss that. So moving on, let's just pivot towards talking about your move to Canada and immigrating itself to a new country is a challenge and you were you and your family were doing it for the second time. So tell us a little bit about that, that why did you guys decide to do that and how was that whole process for you like? Um, yes, it was a, a fun process uh, in India. We lived there for about eight years, but it's very, very hard to get Indian citizenship. 
And if you don't have Indian mm. citizenship, you're not allowed to work. And there's a lot of things that you um, cannot do in India. So that was the only problem we had. And you could go back to Afghanistan uh, because there was a war uh, going mm -hmm. on. And this is why we applied to a Canadian embassy and we explained the situation. We got accepted. The process took uh, about two years. And um, this is how we um, got our um, permanent residency uh, while we were in India um, for Canada and we moved to um, Canada. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that that was one. Otherwise, I would have stayed there. Um, mm. I remember okay, talk about memory um, before. The only yeah. pleasant, it's also a pleasant memory that I have from India is that I uh, participated in a beauty contest in New Delhi because I was excited mm. to become a model, and I made it up to second, uh, up to semi final. Oh wow! And then somebody complained and then said. She's not Indian citizen. What does she do? Oh, no. <laughs> so I was like sad and frustrated uh, first, but then I was like, no, that's okay because she's right. She ha she has absolutely um, the right to be in the part in this uh, contest, but I don't have citizenship, yeah. uh, so I'm not representing. Indian beauty, mm -hmm. it's going to be from another country. So she's absolutely right. She's absolutely right. Yeah. And um, I didn't, I didn't mind it. Uh, so that was a great experience. The excitement of rehearsal and getting ready for the mm. contest and going through this process, that that process, meeting new people, taking pictures, and all that was like great memory. But I'm still um, grateful that at least I had, they gave me that opportunity to join it, to participate in that contest because I was a mm -hmm. teenager. Um, no, I was like 19 year old at the time. And that was the only thing that I wanted mm -hmm. so bad. So if it didn't happen, it would be even worse, you know? Um, yeah. But but they let me join it. They let me participate it. And if later on it didn't happen, it was for, a, for the right reason, you know? And... Mm -hmm. So I, I had the excitement to do it at a time, but now that I have Canadian citizenship, I didn't have that excitement. I I could have participated in any uh, beauty contest in Canada, but I didn't have that passion ag anymore. I didn't have that excitement anymore. Yeah, It was only there in India and at a time. And I'm grateful that they gave me the opportunity to participate. So so th that was the reason we, we had to leave India and move to Canada. And, you know, just for my knowledge and for my listeners also, so we talk a lot about Canadian immigration, coming to Canada and all that. Literally, I think I am completely alien to the Indian immigration system. So if you can educate a little bit that, how did that work? Like, were you on a certain visa in India? Or how did that work? Oh, yes. Um, we were getting a visa through United Nations. Okay. So there was a United Nations office in uh, in India. Uh, yes, you're right. They won't get, they won't let you stay for a long time in India. Every country is like that. You have to have a reason uh, for staying. Uh, it, it has to be investment uh, or business or education or something. Yeah. But we didn't have any of it, any of that. You know. So every family that gets out from um, from a war zone and they they mm -hmm. to India. Uh, they would help them get the visa and tell the Indian government that um, the reason for their for our stay in India is because we cannot go back mm -hmm. to Afghanistan and there's war yeah. going on in Afghanistan and this is how we were getting a visa um, for one year, I believe. And then every year we would uh, renew it. So every year okay. uh, uh, Indian government would be like, okay, so how is everything now? Can they go back to Afghanistan or not? And then the Indian and the United Nations will be like, no, or another year, no. another year. So this is how we were getting uh, our visa. And and so you were studying there, but your parents were, how, how were they working? You can, you're allowed to work on that visa that you get? Uh, no, that was, that was the problem. We were not allowed to work because if you're not, a, in, if you're not an Indian citizen, you're not allowed to work. I am in the United States right now. I am I'm still yeah. waiting for my green card and I'm not working right now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have my health coaching business, which is kind of global. 
And yeah. I can do that, but I'm not allowed to work here in the United States because I'm not an American citizen and I don't even have a green card. Mm. So it's the rule in every country. And India was the same. Uh, we were not allowed to work. But I guess we could uh, open a business, but we didn't do that. We nobody. My father was like old at the time, and he was retired. He he was a businessman all his life. He had import and export business with Germany from Afghanistan to Germany. But at mm-hmm. the time when we lived in India, he was uh, not in a uh, condition in a situation to work. Got help okay. to to start over another business so so that's why um we we couldn't work okay sorry i'm prompting again but my question is how are you making a living then like for eight years you guys were living there yeah my father would sell our properties in afghanistan ah okay we would sell our property in afghanistan bring the money to india because we were kids my brother was a teenager when we came to india we were like 14 15 and um and my mom, of course, was a housewife. My father was retired. So um, so that's what my father was doing. He was uh, selling our properties in, in Afghanistan and then um, he would spend it in India. So let's just go back to the time when you finally moved to Canada. I believe it was in 2001 when you first finally decided to move. Tell us about your first day. What were your like initial impressions or emotions? A lot of excitement. Because uh, now we found a second home, so we lost our first home, which was which was Afghanistan, and we were like temporarily living in India. But now it was our second home, and we knew that yeah. we'll get our citizenship in here, we will start our new life in here, and uh, we will be living here permanently. And um, we were like, we speak the language. That's that's another good thing. Um, will not have any uh, problem um but the first day i remember when i grabbed a couple of things um that i wanted to buy um brought them to the cashier and and the cashier was like uh, your total adds up to this much and, and then, yeah my total what is total like <laughs> i didn't understand because I was <laughs> in india i don't remember maybe it's, it's a different they, they said total uh something but then and, uh, the the pronunciation and accent, everything was different. He's like, oh, different, yeah. What is what does he mean by total? What is total in this? <laughs> it's just a juice and, and some. There's no total in here. <laughs> it was very funny. It was my first day in Canada because like, see yeah. how big a difference was between. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then, but then, at the back of my head, I was like, maybe his English is not good because there's a lot of immigrants <laughs> in Canada. I know we heard, I like that. That. we heard that there's a lot of immigrants <laughs> in Canada. But that was not the case. It was like I was not right I was not wrong because I was I learned it in a different uh, country and he was not wrong yeah. but I thought it was his English that was bad, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's funny and i remember you also saying that english was your fourth language you know your native language was dari which is very similar to farsi i believe it's just a different dialect yeah, yeah. and then you also learned pashto and then urdu so tell us a little bit more about your experiences with the languages in canada yeah absolutely so uh, my uh, mother tongue is, uh, my mother tongue is pashto and and at home, we were speaking Pashto, but we, I was born in Kabul. Uh, the main language in Kabul is uh, Persian. Um, I, I, we call it Dari. It's a different dialect of Persian. Okay. That's spoken in Iran. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was learning uh, Dari at school. And um, so as I grew up, I learned these two languages together at the same time. And when we uh, came to India, of course, I learned um, Hindi, or mm-hmm. uh, Urdu, they call it. Um, so I learned that language. And then um, in Canada, um, so I was learning Hindi and English at the, at the same time in, in, uh, India. in India. And then when we moved to uh, Canada, it was just English. I just focused on my English, which, which made it my fourth language that I was trying to learn. Like properly, yeah. yeah. 
And and were are there like any misunderstandings that might have happened? Of course, you shared one of these, and I'll give you an example with me. Like, if our meet was always with the rolling of R's, like for example, in India we say work, not work. We say birth, not wor- birth, or we say turban, not turban. You know, there's like difference in the R's probably. This is like one of the experiences which I experienced. Another thing was with some vocabulary. Like for example, the word deceased. In my mind, I thought it means finished, like it's completed. In my mind, that's what I thought. I was working at a call center once, Asifa, and uh, uh, I was used to like code the calls at the end to mark it as complete or they're not complete or, or various other options were there. And I kept on marking the calls deceased, deceased, deceased because in my mind, I thought... The calls are completed. They are done. And then my manager called me after a few minutes and he said, so in the past one hour, you have marked 15 calls deceased. Are you saying that you could not speak to 15 people because they are dead? I said, no, in my mind, I thought it means they're completed. So did, did you have, do you remember any such anecdotes, any such instances, maybe in your school, anything that you can think of? You were telling me about your experiences in, in, a, in the class, right? Difficult to understand the professor sometimes. Yeah. Yes, yes, because um, it was a uh, it was a different um, dialect and accent, and I will be focusing a lot and then um, to understand. Uh, it took me like one year um, to to learn uh, English. For first of all, not not fully mm-hmm. learn English, but just the basic before I got to a uh, university. And at the university, I had this problem. And sometimes I would just go to sleep because uh, because when you focus on something so much, um, it's me. I don't know. I just I just go to sleep. So I just go to sleep because of I was because I was focusing so much on uh, <laughs> trying to understand. And I was reading a lot. Then I started reading a lot. And yeah, so from reading, you you understand uh, very well. And another problem was that I was not speaking a lot. Um, with people it was just listening to the lecture and reading and uh for a long time i was like um even now um i'm still struggling when i'm uh, speaking because um uh, because now the, the thing is that i speak all four language uh, um mm-hmm. kind of at the same time like during the day i have indian friends in here i have um friends from uh, Kabul uh, dairy speak yeah. uh, friends so I can speak all languages uh, simultaneously um, on regular <laughs> yeah. basis every week every day um, so maybe that's not letting me focus on just one language and and become like like 100% fluent in that language you know so it's all yeah. like from this language to this switching from one language to another could be that it's it's also about what language you think in, right? Like lots of time people say, oh, I think in a certain language, but I can't communicate in the same. Yes. <laughs> Is that the case with you as well? Exactly. Yes. Yes. So I always think in, uh, in, in Pashto and sometimes, but then I also took some uh, French classes in India and uh, one thing I learned about uh, from them is that they said learn French uh from french with french like yeah you don't you don't translate your language in french learn french mm. in french absolutely so that's the one thing so now i'm still struggling with that so i think in, in in pashto and i kind of speak in pashto in my mind and then translate that in uh, mm. english which is not the right way uh, and i've been telling this to everyone who's trying to learn a second language or third language just forget about yeah. what for, uh, forget about your own language learn the new language in that language so english in english yeah. this is how you will uh, perfect it so um so but i'm still struggling with it sometimes because it's a habit it's um, childhood it was my uh, mother thing and i was thinking and speaking in that language um but but now i know but i think it's also the effort that counts you know you 
just trying to learn that fourth language i think that's commendable and then there are people here who sometimes even question your languages or your accents right like especially like in canada when i came people would question and but they don't see that we are literally speaking our third language for example i speak hindi punjabi and then the english yes. Okay, so if I let just pivot towards a little bit about the cultural uh, differences, cultural shock, so to say. So, was there like any uh, the most interesting cultural difference that you encountered when you first arrived in Canada? I'll give you like my example. That for me, the biggest cultural shock was calling my professors by their name, because in India we always say sir or ma'am. So, yeah, do, do, do you remember any of those? Yes, yes, I remember that. I've not noticed that, but I remember that now. Yeah, I was, I wasn't feeling comfortable calling my professor by name because it was the same thing in yeah. Afghanistan and India, and I've been doing that yeah. for a long time. And and I came to Canada, and it was like a different, completely different uh, culture. And uh, the what should I call it? Uh, unpleasant or ugly, ugly uh, memory that I have in in Canada is that. Um, we were still learning, um, and I think I was um, learning uh, English. It was English class or math, math class. Yes, it was our math class. I was preparing for my um, university. So uh, we had a, a, an exam, um, and, and the exam was a little bit hard. So, of course, all exams are hard, and we are all working yeah. on this uh, paper. We are still writing the exam. And then one guy, a Canadian guy, got up. And he took the paper, the exam paper, and he slammed it on the paper uh, on the table where our teacher was sitting. Okay. Because he was mad. Because he was like, "Why did you make this exam so complicated?" So he, he no. literally took the paper and then he boom uh, slammed it on the table. And I looked. Everybody else looked. Was like, What's going on? And I was like, that, "That's a little bit." I mean, disrespect to, to the teacher, you know, to me, it was because I was still uh, learning about adjusting and learning about the culture. Maybe it's not, like, it's, it's just him. He just showed who he was and how he felt uh, in, in the exam. Yeah. Maybe he was right. Maybe the exam was complicated for that level. I don't know, but then I'm not judging him. I'm not saying that he, what he did was wrong. But to me, it was a cultural shock, you know? That was like the first mm. cultural shock. And it was ugly because at the time, I, was, uh, I thought it was ugly because I was like, you always respect your teacher. Like, you Absolutely. Respect your parents, you always respect them. You do, like whatever problem you have, you, you say it with respect, you know? So <laughs> that, was, that was funny. And then the professor just, uh, the teacher just smiled and, we went ahead with the exam. <laughs> so huh. okay. Yeah, this reminds me that I also noticed another thing very similar to this was actually getting heads on with the teacher in a class. Like being able to debate. That is not something I think we were uh able to do in India. But here people were very casually debating. No. I, like even the saying the word no, I don't agree with you. I don't agree the way you are saying this. We just cannot we just could not say that in India. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So these are differences that uh, I was always experiencing at school, at the university, um, and then also the students would just leave the class before uh, the class ended, which was hmm. I was okay with that because I was like, in our culture, you have to sit at sit uh, till the class is finished. Even if you have yeah. to go out, there, there could be some reason that you want to go out. It could be a phone call. It could be mm -hmm. that uh, you're not feeling good. You know, you're allowed to yeah. any time or, or maybe you have an appointment, you know, but um, if it's uh, going to cause a problem, it will, it will be your problem, not, not a teacher's problem, you know. But then I would see um, in the class, people leaving before the class was ended. I was like, my God, you're not supposed to. Because the, the professor would get mad if we leave the class uh, before it's ended. That's how it was in, in Afghanistan. So there were a lot of yep. things that uh, we would just observing that I would just observe and then adjust to it, learn about it, and justify it. So that, that was a fun experience. And the same thing uh, with uh, 
America and even in America here they are doing some things differently than than Canada. So I'm all now I'm have become expert in adjusting, starting a new life, mm, adjusting to it. Of starting course. a new life and adjusting yeah. to it. So because that's that's what I have been doing all my life almost. Okay. So, so speaking of which, tell us that how has your this uh, um, multicultural background influenced your sense of identity? How would you define that? Um, to a great extent, I just feel that I'm nobody, <laughs> and and I'm proud of uh, saying that. Hmm. Before I was holding to a to a to a to an identity. Mm-hmm. Oh, here I'm Afghan. I am. I'm a student. I'm this and that. Uh, I'm the daughter of so and so. In India, I was like, um, it was a different. It was like now I'm, I'm, I'm Asifa. I am doing this, or I'm from Afghanistan. Um, adjusting to this life. And in Canada, I came to Canada. Now I'm like I'm Canadian now. So I'm Afghan Canadian, Afghan Canadian. Mm-hmm. Not Canadian mm-hmm. Canadian, but Afghan Canadian. That was my identity, kind of, you know. And then um, now here in the U.S., would I call myself Afghan, Canadian, American? Because I'm soon going to mm-hmm. get my green card. I got married here uh, about a year ago. So now I'm at the point that I don't want any identity. I am mm. Asifa. That's yeah. it. I'm Asifa. I'm a free spirit. I'm experiencing life mm-hmm. in every place, in every country. But it doesn't, whatever the fan experience is not me. That's my experience. And there will be more experience, more experience. I cannot hmm. be everything. Mm-hmm. And now I'm more spiritual. I'm learning from Sadhguru. He's a very mm-hmm. famous uh, yeah. Indian mystic. And he mm-hmm. talks about it. He's like, detach your, your identity your body from who you are. Who you are is not what you look like. Who you are is not your physical body. Who you are is a different thing. It's your spirit. Yeah. It's your soul. So so now with all these identities, I wanted to become a lawyer. I want to become a lawyer. I was studying criminal law. Yeah. I want I want to become I want to become this. I want to become this. But now I just want to become asif yeah yeah that's that's a great answer i like the way how you put it that all these experiences have made you and you are asifa because of all these experiences you are not asifa because not you are uh, need to be identified with a certain nationality or something i like that i like the way you are thinking that's amazing. yes yes i'm not looking for any identity anymore i'm looking for experience so my identity mm. is known now. It's just Asifa. And I have borrowed this body from from our mother earth. And I'm experiencing mm-hmm. um, life mm-hmm. with the tool that I have, which is my body. And this is what I have learned from Sadhguru. So, um, yeah. so this is, life, life is all about experience. Painful experience, joy, s- Anything that sadness, sorrow, mm-hmm. all experience, just experience it, just keep experiencing. I never say I'm sad mm. as, because I'm a soul. I'm, I'm not, I'm asafa. I'm a happy uh, person. I'm not sad. Sadness is just experience, you know. Becoming a lawyer is just an experience. I am depressed. I would never say that. I used to say that a lot. In Canada, when I came after two years or so, I became very depressed because it was a big cultural shock and, and loneliness and mm-hmm. I lost social life and the um, mm-hmm. interaction with humans and everything. I was feeling depressed. But but I've changed my language now. If I, if I say I'm depressed that would be wrong to say it. I feel depressed. That would be okay because this is how you feel. It's an experience. It's not you. Hmm. Who you are is is different. Who you are is the spirit. The spirit is never depressed. Uh, so so now I 
don't attach anything to 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 myself hmm i like that you know i think uh, we also hear this quote sometimes that it's just a bad day it's not a bad life or like a, you are not a bad person it's just an experience it is experience yeah and then and then if you're trying to to avoid uh, pain and avoid um um let's say complication and everything you are not living mm. if you're living this is a part of life you know joy absolutely sorrow. Uh, pain, complication, problems, it's all part of life. We cannot avoid one thing and then choose another thing. We are here to experience both. So I, I always tell my, my friends when they are like complaining about life, I'm like, you are greater than the problem that you have. Mm -hmm. If you just give it time um, and then a little bit thinking, it will, it will go away. It's not permanent. Mm -hmm. Nothing permanent you know um so you will come out of it strong and, and happy just that's not life as you just said that's not life yeah. so life is not pain or sorrow it's happiness and joy okay so see if I, this would be like a great segue to talk about you know keep glowing sana like you said you were a crim you were studying criminal law and then you transitioned into becoming like a holistic health coach tell us like how did that happen and also a little bit about your business yeah sure um law, it was always my passion to learn law criminal law that's why i started it and i wanted to uh, become a lawyer so i still have mm -hmm. one year left to become a lawyer and i realized I realized that it was it was my passion uh, for sure, but then at the same time, help was my passion as well because every time I took a break from my studies um, during the day, I would just research um, articles and books about health. How how can I um, stay healthy? How can I um, improve my skin and my energy? I would do that and then and then I was like I I love this and uh, why don't I just uh, um I learned, I became a juice therapist also took uh, uh, some classes and became a juice therapist so I was like now I want to open a juice bar and um help people um with this product because it all started with uh, uh, with soda. I was seeing my friends drinking a lot of soda and, and, and I knew how um, harmful soda is for them. But then I learned about mm -hmm. how healthy juice is for you. And I was like, uh, maybe I should just open a juice bar and I have very good healthy um, juice recipes and offer it to people um, so they can stay healthy. As, as I am, because I was drinking it um, every week and every day, and I wanted everybody to mm. experience that and, and then uh, stay healthy. But then I was still studying um, for my um, for my master's. But then I, I, one day I was like, uh, I graduated, and uh, my marks were like very good. Um, they, uh, my mm -hmm. professor would give me bonus, and I was like very excited about that. But then all of a sudden, in uh, in oh, after I graduated, two weeks after I graduated, instead of applying for uh, jobs, um, I was like, no, I'm going to open a juice bar. So I mm -hmm. came to Arizona. I talked to the to uh, places where I'll be kitchen kitchens also uh, actually to to make juices because we were I was not allowed to uh, make it at home. Uh, of course, I was mm -hmm. started small, so um, the, the Arizona government said that you have to have a commercial area. So I was like very close to sign the lease um, and uh, start making juice in that kitchen. The COVID um, broke out. <laughs> mm. COVID nineteen broke out, and I was again very frustrated. And it was like, and again another turning point, another big change in my life because I was all prepared to open a juice bar, and then. Um, the COVID uh, broke out and then I, it, it was risky to do that. And and first I was frustrated and I was sad, but then I was like, oh my God, I should be grateful because if I signed that lease, nobody would be buying juice because all business uh, were closed. When business were getting, you would be stuck. Yeah, bookings were getting canceled. Flights were getting canceled. 
then I would be stuck with this uh, lease for uh, yeah. maybe a year or so. <laughs> and so well, I should be grateful instead of complaining. You know, this is why I believe. I believe that things happen for a reason, you know. I didn't know what mm. the reason was at the time, but but that was the main reason. That's why I delayed. So I was like, that's good that it didn't happen and I didn't waste uh, money. Um, but then I was like, what am I going to do now? Uh, so I thought I would just uh, gather all my knowledge that I have and uh, put it in a program because everyone was asking me about my program. Everyone was asking me how how come I'm healthier and looking younger than they are? They were my age, mm. my friends were my age. What are you <laughs> doing? I was like, I just have some tips and a lifestyle that I um, follow for a couple of years. That's all. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to gather all the information uh, in a program. I put it in a program. If it worked for me, it's going to work for you. And it already worked for you. And I'm just going to share it with uh, everyone else. And then I also got um, certified as a holistic um, health coach. Um, mm -hmm. So that's that's how um, that's how it started. So I just switched from one thing to another. I'm not saying that it was all waste of time, but when I look back at it, I spent so much money and and time and effort yeah. to um, to become a lawyer, you know. <laughs> but then. Mm -hmm. It's okay. I, there, another message um, to everyone who's listening is, is that it's okay. Everything that happens in your life is okay. If you have done something and it didn't work out the way you want it, it's okay. And if you switch from one thing to another, it's okay. So my, all my life, I thought my only passion was to become a lawyer. But then later in my life, I learned that, no, becoming a lawyer, when I was studying for my, uh, for my law degree, I was mm -hmm. like, getting tired of studying that. And then I would switch to something else, and which was health. But when now, when I'm studying about health, I'm researching about health, I never get tired. Even if I do get tired, I still want to do more research. I still want to learn more to an extent that I force myself to not do it anymore because it's my passion. I'm enjoying it. Sometimes I stay and, and I'm studying till late night. I don't mind it. But when I was studying law, there was a limit. Okay, now I'm tired of close the book. But when, when I'm studying about health, I don't want to close the book. I want to study and learn like forever there's no limit yeah so, so you you learn about yourself it's all it's life is all about discovering about yourself learning about yourself it's okay mm -hmm. if you just switch your career it's okay if you change your location it's it's, it's all it's all okay because you're learning you're growing you know yeah. um so that's that's another message and people are like oh my god and then people are criticizing it then you're you spend this much money why did you switch your career it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah. I even highlight this one thing you mentioned that, you know, everything does not happen to you. It happens for you. You just have to find the good in every adversity that come your way. And yes, uh, Sifa, I think me along with my listeners can, I think, hear the passion in your voice when you talk about this health coaching business. So tell me like where people can connect with you if you just want to consult you. Instagram. Facebook, LinkedIn, it's just my name, Asafa Popal. And they can look for uh, for me on Instagram um, or uh, Facebook or LinkedIn, whatever platform uh, they're active at. I'm mostly active on uh, LinkedIn uh, now now because it's my favorite. I learn a lot from LinkedIn and I also teach um, a lot on LinkedIn. Um, that's the only um, uh, platform i'm active on uh, for now and i also offer um a free um a coaching um uh, session like the first uh, mm -hmm. session is free for everyone it's just getting to know the person and i just love uh talking about about health and it's also a good experience for me because uh because every person is different i customize um, um 
health program for each person. It's not one program for everybody. Uh, it doesn't work that way. So the more I learn about different people, the more I um, enhance my knowledge. So this is my win. When I offer free session to people, I learn about them, about their health issues. And at the same time, it's a win for them because I create a mini health program for them that they can implement right after the call. So if anyone's interested, I, uh, I, I offer them free uh, coaching session. So to all my listeners, links to contact Asifa can be found in the show notes. So Zeeva, before we jump into the final segment, I very quickly just want to touch upon the point which we discussed earlier was immigrating with parents or with your family comes with own set of challenges, which uh, people might not understand. And they say, oh, you your chores might be taken care of, your cooking might be taken care of, you can focus on your career or your education. But that's not the case. It comes with own set of challenges and own set of dynamics. And I want to just, since you, you have gone, you have experienced that, tell us a little bit about those pros and cons, if you can share. Yeah, of course. Um, so when I was uh, studying at the university, we had I lived with my uh, family, and then uh, there were students who lived on campus. Um, so their family mm-hmm. was away, like in India or Europe, but they lived on on campus at the university. At the university, and they would look at me. They would be like, "Oh, um, we now we have to go home, and then we have to cook sometimes. We have to do our laundry. We have to um, buy a grocery and all that. You're you're lucky when you go home." Your food is ready. You bring home uh, mm. food from home sometimes. It's ready. And um, and then uh, you, your mom might, might be doing your laundry also. Like sometimes she does when I have exams, but not all the time. And uh, she thought I was in a, they thought I was in a good position. But then I was like, no, I think you guys are in a good position because because for me on the weekends, uh, I have, she, my mom doesn't speak English. I have to take her to the doctor. I have to take her to grocery shopping and uh, mm-hmm. I have to take her to her friend's place if she wants to visit any of her friends. And um, that takes time, energy, and effort. And it distracts me yeah. from my uh, school, from my studies. I give her like one full day to do all this and sometimes one, one and a half day. So the weekend is only two days and I don't have much time to study. You guys um, don't have that. It's just you and your school. Hmm. So there's like pros and cons in each um, uh, situation, but but we have to be grateful in both um, cases because absolutely, if you, you just learn how to adjust to it, just ha- learn how to deal with it. If you're if you're like living alone and you're studying, that's awesome because. It's now you and, and your, all your focus is on your school and yourself. It's so easy mm. to do that. Like you can just plan it. Uh, you cannot manage time. That's, I don't agree with that. You manage activities. So you manage mm. your activities. And you're um, and being this activity or this task at this time on this day. And this is how you will make it work. And then when you come home, it's you and your school and, and, and your studies. Um, which is better, which makes it look better. But then on the other hand, um, uh, yes, I was like spending time and effort with my with my mom and my family and my like teenager brother also. But then at the same time, when you come home, you're tired from all day, and then you talk, you you give them a hug, you you talk to them, um, yeah. you talk to them how good your day was or how bad your day was and how you did in school. And uh, you get this positive energy from them. You, uh, they pray for you. They wish you success. And then you talk yeah. all you talk about all that. And there's energy exchange. All the stress will go away, and then you uh, yeah. feel better and uh, positive and and um, eager for the next day. And uh, go to sleep very good because now you have someone that's supporting you emotionally. And uh, wish you success in your in your studies. So yeah. So it's just up to you. Just find the good things in every situation and focus on those good things. You know, not yeah. on negative things. 
yeah, yeah. Definitely no situation is better than the other. It's it's just about how you perceive it. Yes. <laughs> That's how I would say that, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so Asifa, now we're in the final segment of the podcast. I call it Beneath the Accent. I'm going to ask a couple of questions. You can answer them in one word or a sentence or however you feel like. The idea is just to know more about Asifa. So are you ready? Sure. So first is what advice would you give to Asifa who is in the initial months of landing in Canada? So my only advice would be to that younger Asifa that landed in Canada. Don't be so stubborn that you know what you're going to do. Mm. That you know what your passion is. Just be a little bit flexible. Ask people. Ask people, connect mm-hmm. to people, talk to people. Um like whatever you want to become, like find that person as a mentor. Like I, I wanted to study political mm-hmm. science. I should have talked to someone who has studied political science and, mm-hmm. and then I use their advice uh, as, as my mentor and do a little bit of research and see, is it what I want? Is it, is it what I really want? You know, but no, I was mm-hmm. very stubborn, very stubborn. I was like, no, this is it. I'm just doing this political science, no matter how I'm just doing this. <laughs> and then I wasn't doing well uh, in, in political science. Um, I didn't like it and switched it. And then um, my mo- when, you're, when you're not, when, when you don't have like a strong passion for something, you, mm-hmm. uh, you fail. That's what happened. Political science, I thought I had a strong passion for it, but I didn't. Because my marks mm. were like suffering. My grades were going down, 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 down all, all the time. And to the point that I was almost failing it. And then with criminal law, my marks were like going up, going up, mm. up. And then I was even getting a like, um, bonus. So it'll be 100 mm-hmm. out of 100, then a bonus on top of that. But that was my oh. real passion, I thought, you know. And then came my health journey, which is even <laughs> better than uh, what I've been yeah. doing all this time. So so, okay. so that would be my only advice to, to, the, to the younger us for the landed. Okay. And is there any worst advice someone ever gave you? A lot. A lot of uh, uh, advices. Um, and they all didn't come from my family, hmm. to be honest. Yes, our families are great. Our family always, in, in our culture, our, our family always want us to become best, to become something, to find an identity, become an engineer, a lawyer, or, or anything. The classic professions. Yes, uh, but at the same time, <laughs> it, it's you. It's your life. It's your passion. It's your ability. It's your capacity. It's different. They don't understand that. They just want mm. this, and then what you are is maybe different. So the greatest advices that came to me were not from my family, and and the reason for that is because they wanted some something different for me, and I wanted something different for me. Mm-hmm. They didn't understand me. I understand. I understood myself. And the greatest advice mm-hmm. from business coaches. I followed my passion, which was doing, um, which was opening a juice bar. And I was listening to all these business coaches and learned from them. So many advices that I learned from them. So many things that I learned from them about myself. So many things mm-hmm. I learned from, let's say, sad guru about myself. Yep. Like I, a lot of things that I didn't know about myself, I learned from them. And then it resonated to me. I was like, oh my God, yes, that's, that's absolutely right. So I followed those advice. And then there's another thing that I... Um, always do, and and that is, I don't want to do anything that my family has done. I don't. Mm-hmm. I would do anything that my culture would say. Don't do it. I would do anything that my religion would say. Don't do it. I would do anything yeah. that my family would say. Don't do it. I would do it. I'd still do it. Yeah, yeah. To experience it. Just like say, I'm breaking yeah. the program. I'm breaking the program because I know that my parents mm. were following a program. They were told what to do. They did it. Yeah. And then, and then they want us to do 
what they did. It doesn't have to be that way. Absolutely. Every person should have a different life. There should be changes. There should be improvement, progress, growth, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so that's another thing that I that I was doing since I was a teenager. Participating in this beauty contest was against my culture. It was against my religion. It was against my family reputation, you know? My yeah. mom was not happy about it when I did that. I didn't tell my brothers about it. I didn't tell my mm -hmm. father about it, but I still do. I still did it because my spirit was telling me, "Just do it. It's just something different. Just do it." the The one thing that they wanted to, me to do at the time was to get married, find a husband, have children. That's what they wanted for me to do. But mm -hmm. I was, I rejected it. I was like, "No." I'm not doing that. I'm doing something different. This is something that my grandmother did, my grand-grandmother did, and you did, but I don't have to do that. I want to do something different, you know? <laughs> I want to do yeah. this. I want to study. I want to participate in this uh, beauty contest. Um, there's so much in, in life. So yeah. that's, <laughs> that's what I've been doing <laughs> all my life. I'm so glad you did that. Good for you. And I think more power to other women as well, you know, who will just stand against these uh, traditional orthodox ideologies. I really hope they fight there. And I always say that our parents are a product of their own time and they try to pass on what they were taught in yes. their time. And you don't have to follow it all the time. No. So it's okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm not saying that <laughs> nobody should listen to our parents at all. I'm not saying that at all because there were a lot of things that they taught yeah, us. Of course. The values that we have now come from them. Respecting yeah. respecting people, discipline. There's so many things that we learn from them and we uh, and I re and I respect them for teaching me that. There's so many things, but then at the same time my my point is not everything has to be what they want us to to do or or, or that, that's my point. I'm not saying that we shouldn't be listening to our parents at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. So what's that one thing you learned from each country you lived in, starting from Afghanistan, then India, and then Canada? Okay. So um, respect, a lot of respect from Afghanistan, and then love from India. There's so much love hmm. in India. There is so much love in India. They love everything. They love humans. They love <laughs> animals. They res they love and respect every single thing. So that's what I learned. And Canada, just freedom. Hmm. Canada taught me that you don't agree with someone, you're not disrespecting that person. Because mm -hmm. that's very mm -hmm. human. I mean, it's not a disrespect. People will. It's people's perception that that someone is disrespecting someone, but it's not disrespect. You don't agree with someone, you're not disrespecting that person. So Canada mm -hmm. gave me freedom. Uh, before I was like, like you know, afraid, afraid to talk to people. If someone knows better than me, I shouldn't be um, arguing with that person. I shouldn't be yeah. disagreeing with that person, even if I disagree with, with that person. But, but in Canada, you're free to disagree. Tell them. Mm -hmm. person oh, I, I don't agree with with your point oh, yeah i just but i respect your uh, your opinion i don't dis i don't agree with it you're free to choose what you want to do you, you are free to choose what you want to study you know family yeah. give a lot of freedom to their children when they're over 18 they can choose whatever they want their family don't tell them they give them freedom to choose what they want they don't tell them absolutely so freedom from canada so who's your go-to person when you feel stuck when i feel stuck I listen to my intuition. Okay. That would be my go-to person. First, I just sit, I meditate, then I uh, just talk talk with my with my soul. This is my problem. This is my because when you have a problem, when you talk to people about it, people most of the time, ninety nine percent of the time, people have their own interest when they are helping you. They will not help you just because they want to help you. They have, mm -hmm. they have some kind of interest and they will, they will advise you accordingly. So when I have problems, I don't go to people. I sit with myself, okay. I, I meditate, I think about it, 
And then I give it time. I give the time a couple of days. And then I hear answers from one place or another. I hear, I hear it. And you said that you have watched a lot of Bollywood movies. So can you name a few that you really love? Yeah, it would be Tal. <laughs> Tal? Oh, okay. <laughs> Ashwara Rai. Yeah, I love that yes. movie so much. Uh, I watched hmm. it in a theater in uh, in India, in New Delhi. Um, that was an amazing uh, experience. I, I liked so many, a lot of Indian movies, but that's the only one that I uh, like so much. So how would you describe Canada in one word or a sentence? Canada is my second and permanent home. And I have a high respect and deep love for, for Canada. Even if Afghanistan gets better than Canada today, I would still Canada. Mm-hmm. And finally, if you could leave me with one piece of advice, Asifa, what would it be? Keep, keep learning. Keep learning. We are students of life. So what you're doing mm-hmm. right now is you're learning from people's life. Yeah. So just don't give, give this up. Just keep doing it because you don't learn when you're just sitting in, in, in home and you're just surrounded by your family. I mm-hmm. wish I uh, had time to do this. The pot talk. Mm. I love it so much because uh, every week I learn to some kind of podcast every week, especially about health. I learn about people because every person is a teacher. Whatever they yeah. experience in their life, you haven't. And how many times, how many lives would you live to have all the experience people have in your life. No, Absolutely. No way. But when you have a podcast, you learn about people's experience. You don't have to live yeah. like a hundred lives. You just meet a hundred people and then learn from them, learn from their experiences, learn from their failures, learn from, from their knowledge. You know, this is a great thing that you're doing. And I, and I, the only advice, my advice to you would be keep it up. I love the way you put the whole thing together. I love that. So on that, Asifa, thank you so much for being on the podcast and adding value to me and to my listeners. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I had a good time with you. Hey, listener. Thank you for making it to the end. I highly, highly appreciate you listening to the podcast. Subscribe to the podcast if you haven't as yet. And please share with your friends or anybody you think would like it. And like I always say, we encourage you to follow your heart. But also us on Instagram, the handle is My Thick Accent. You can also leave us a review or write to us at hello at mythickaccent.com. So stay tuned and let's continue knowing each other beneath the accent.